So in this conversation, I'm going to be talking about the First World War, this very horrific uh, war, which lasted for about four years, involved many of the countries in Europe, as well as some of the countries around the world. In addition to those European countries that were the main belligerents in the conflict, uh, the war began in 1914 and ended in late 1918. And it was called a world war for a reason. It was the first time that the world had truly been embroiled in a conflict that spanned continents and oceans. And it was, of course, an extremely bloody conflict in the sense that something like 8 million people died directly as a result of this conflict. So when we try to understand World War I, we have to come to grips to some extent with what its causes were. And this is an immensely complicated thing. In fact, probably literally hundreds of books have been written conjecturing on the causes of World War I. And there are different ideas as to what caused World War I and why it happened. But I'd like to speak in very general terms about the basic ideas of a very famous anthropologist, economist, and historian named Karl Polanyi. Karl Polanyi wrote a book called The Great Transformation. And The Great Transformation begins in its first chapter with a chapter called The Hundred Years' Peace. That Hundred Years' Peace describes the period from 1815, the defeat of Napoleon, to 1914, when World War I began. And what Polanyi tried to understand is why did Europe which had formerly in the 18th century been almost constantly at war, during this period of basically a century over the course of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, experienced peace. Now we should put that in relative terms because although European countries were not by and large fighting with each other, at least on a large scale, during this period inside of Europe, of course, as we've seen in conversations, for instance, about imperialism, they were generating plenty of conflict outside of the borders of Europe. Nonetheless, just the fact that they weren't involved in major wars inside of Europe during this period is noteworthy. We don't have time to go into the whole story of why Polanyi thinks this is so, but just in the context of trying to understand why Polanyi thinks this Hundred Years Peace in fact broke down so spectacularly in the case of World War I, we should identify that Polanyi speaks of something called a double movement in the capitalist system. And what it basically means is this, that the closer that civilization comes to realizing liberal free trade, that is a world where barriers to trade are eliminated and goods and services can move across borders freely, first of all, this is not ever totally realizable because political concerns always take some precedence. But the closer that it does come to be in, uh, into fruition and the, closest, the closer to which domestic markets are liberalized, the more in fact that this generates bubbles and volatility. So for instance, we saw already that in 1873, this brief liberal blooming of the 1860s was essentially undone by the first great global financial crisis, which was in many ways the product of this liberalization. Well, what the double movement implies is that once you get closer to a, if you like, frictionless liberal economy, then that volatility inherent in that economy will eventually lead to uh, collapse, lead to financial crises, which will cause a pulling back. That is the other side of this double movement, moving toward liberalism and then pushing away from it. And this moving away from it can take various forms. It can take the political form of protectionism, states seeking to uh, re-entrench their economies and protect themselves from, if you like, the volatile winds of the global economy. It can take the form of imperialism, st states seeking to secure territory that will not be subject to uh, liberal trade, but will be theirs and unalienably theirs. It can take also the form of uh, entirely anti-capitalist politics, like, say, communism or fascism. But what we've already seen in the discussion of imperialism is that after the crisis of 1873, there was this, if you like, international political response and the formation of these global empires, which added to the already existing empires of the French and the English. And when that happened, that started to create tension. So in some ways, what we have to understand the First World War as, as the final eruption of this tension of empires emerging 
from the 1870s, 1880s, and finally exploding in this horrible conflict that we now call the First World War. Okay, so this process of building inter-imperial tension is something that we see starting at the end of the 19th century. We could mention tensions between European powers and non-European powers, like for instance the Boxer Rebellion of 1899 to 1901, when Chinese uh, people in northern China revolted against the idea of uh, occupation and influence by Europeans. But we could also mention several cases of building tension between European powers outside of Europe. For instance, we've talked about the concept of the scramble for Africa. And although that was essentially a peaceful process, again, exclusively in the context here of European relations, because it was we've seen in the context, especially of the Belgian Congo, it was not so peaceful if you were an African. Nonetheless, even between Europeans, there were certain flashpoints. For instance, in 1898, at a place called Fashoda in what is now Sudan, in the reaches of the upper Nile River. Basically, the northward trajectory of the British Empire in Africa met with the east-west trajectory of the French Empire through Africa, and they sort of reached this point of confluence at Fashoda, where there was a standoff between the British and the French over who would occupy this territory, this key strategic point, which would provide access to the, basically the entire reach of the upper Nile. Finally, the French backed down, but not before it almost came to a war. We might also mention uh, a real war that did happen in Africa around the same time, the Second Boer War from 1899 to 1902, when uh, in the regions of the upper Transvaal in what is now South Africa was discovered gold and a little bit later diamonds. And so the British, which had a colony, the Cape Colony in uh, South Africa basically invaded this territory of the Northern Transvaal, which was occupied by people called the Boers, who were Dutch immigrants, and a nasty, ugly guerrilla war ensued, again, partly over this desire for riches and resources. We could also mention, which has been briefly noted in previous discussion, the Spanish-American War of 1898, when, of course, the uh, Americans from the United States uh, attacked the Spanish in their colony of Cuba. Okay, so uh, these, however, uh, and along with this, we could also mention, say, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 were conflicts between expanding European or, uh, in the case of the Spanish-American War and uh, Russo-Japanese War, extra-European empires, and they did produce conflict, but they didn't produce anything on the scale, of course, of World War I. So what was it then that made these tensions between expanding empires in this capitalist world finally uh, spill over into a truly global conflict that cost millions of lives? Well, we need to introduce another one of these emerging empires into the mix to begin explaining that. And that brings us to our first artifact. This is an image of the German Braunschweig battleship uh, launched in 1904. So that gives you a hint about the empire we're going to be talking about, and that is the German Empire. Now, we don't have time to talk about this in any great detail, but suffice it to say that Germany, despite being a very old cultural and linguistic concept, people could speak of Germany in the 18th century, for instance, but in that case, they would be talking about a region rather than a nation state, that is, rather than a coherent single country that had defined borders and sovereignty. Germany in the 18th century, for instance, or even the early 19th century, was a patchwork of little countries and some bigger countries, uh, all of which spoke German and all of which were in the same region, but were not politically unified. Well, that unification finally did come at the expense of some German-speaking regions, namely Austria, which was left out of this country called Germany. But in 1871, under the auspices of this large German state called Prussia, finally a country called Germany was knit together. So that is to say that Germany arrived on the world stage very late in the game. Nonetheless, it was a country that was experiencing very rapid industrialization. And by around 1900, in fact, Germany had equaled or perhaps even very slightly surpassed the United Kingdom as an industrial power. That said, Germany was not a big empire like Britain, right? It had some territory that it had occupied in 
Africa as a result of this Berlin Conference in 1885. We've already mentioned, for instance, the territory that's now Namibia or German East Africa. Uh, and it had a few bits and pieces elsewhere around the globe, but Germany didn't have anything like uh, an empire to match that of the British or the French in terms of territory. So there's one, if you like, interpretation of the build-up to World War I, which is that fundamentally what we're dealing with here is a clash between the interests of this formerly and still great British Empire, which occupied something like a third of the Earth's surface, and this new upstart country, which had uh, at least equaled Britain as an industrial power in Europe, Germany, but did not have the kind of clout on the global stage as an empire that Britain or even France did. So symbolized, therefore, in this first artifact, the Braunschweig battleship, is the emergence of tension between these two most important powers in Europe, Britain and Germany. Britain, as we have seen elsewhere, was the preeminent naval power in the world. Britain prided itself on naval supremacy, the fact that it could control the seas via its navy, and no other country could challenge that supremacy until Germany attempted to by building huge uh, metal battleships, like for instance this Braunschweig, which when it was launched was the biggest in the world. Well, two years later the British responded by creating a battleship called the Dreadnought, which became part of this so-called Dreadnought class of battleships, and then even bigger ones were built called Super Dreadnoughts. So what we're seeing here is the formation of an arms race between Germany and Britain. And that arms race, however, is emblematic of the bigger problem of tensions between the old established empire of Britain and the new upstart empire of Germany and its perceived lack of, if you like, respect on the world stage. Some people describe this desire for expansion on the part of Germany, this new country, as Germany's quest for a place in the sun, this desire to somehow have its Politi international political clout match its uh, economic clout. So there was a certain sector of German society which sought to expand, and indeed this expansion would take the shape of mostly eastward movement into the territories of Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe, so that Germany would somehow become a huge territorial empire, especially within Europe. But of course, this was a problem for not just the British, but for, Fr for the French and other countries which sought to limit Germany's power. Okay, so that's point one, uh, which is to say that although this expansion of European empire throughout the globe from the period after the 1870s caused tensions, they weren't enough to really spark something like a world war. But once you add this new country, Germany, into the mix and its particular relationship with Europe, you have something potentially more explosive. In addition to that, we have to note that not only were certain empires like Germany or Japan or indeed the United States emerging on the scene in the late 19th century and expanding uh, their territorial interest, but other places were declining. Most important among those places declining in power was the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire was centered in what's now Turkey, but it occupied much of North Africa, the Middle East, the territory, for instance, around what is now Iraq or Kuwait, as well as the Balkan Peninsula, that is that region of southern Europe, including Greece, Albania, what, is, what was formerly called Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, etc. So this was a very large and diverse multi-ethnic empire, and for complicated reasons, really going back to the 19th century, it started to disintegrate, little bit by little bit. And so independent countries were, if you like, hacked off from the corpus of the Ottoman Empire, like Greece, which became uh, independent in the 19th century, or Romania, or Bulgaria. But the empire nonetheless remained substantially intact. And among European powers, there was on the one hand an interest in not seeing the Ottoman Empire completely die out, because this would create a vacuum of power. While on the other hand, to the extent that it was crumbling, getting in on the action and taking uh, a territorial interest in the newly independent states or regions that could be occupied when vacated by the Ottomans. For instance, in 1908, the Austrian Empire annexed a region of former Ottoman territory called Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, 
Okay, so this is a region, therefore, that is in political flux. And into this mix, we have to situate this competition for power, which involves not just the Germans and the English, because it also involves, for instance, the Russians. But especially, uh, we can say that the tensions between the Germans and the British are key here. So this brings us to Artifact 2. This is an image of what is generally considered the first serviceable and indeed patented uh, automobile. This is the Benz patent Motorwagen, uh, built in 1885, patented early the next year. And of course, this is essentially the first car built by the company, which is now uh, Daimler-Benz, or better known as Mercedes-Benz. And why is this important in the context of tensions between Germany and Britain or these empires generally? Well, it's because uh, the car, of course, is run by a certain form of locomotion. And that locomotion is not the steam engine powered by coal, as we've thus far seen in our discussions of technology and industry, but by a piston-driven internal combustion engine, which is powered by some form of gasoline. So although the combustion engine actually has roots going way, way back in history and uh, was perfected or at least made viable somewhat earlier than the image we see here of this four-cycled engine on the patent Motorwagen from 1885, it was nonetheless the automobile which above all symbolizes the importance and the new viability of uh, the engine and of course the fuel that is behind it gasoline in this new age. So that is to say really that what we're talking about from the very late 19th century is the emergence of another stage of capitalism. We have industries like chemicals which are becoming increasingly important but above all we are emerging into the petroleum age. So by 1900 oil and the search and desire for oil and the acquisition of territories and concessions that produce oil is increasingly geopolitically important. And of course countries like Britain and Germany didn't have their own oil. Of course we now know that Britain has oil in the North Sea, but that wasn't known about it at that time. So there was tremendous interest in gaining control or access to concessions in those places that did have oil. And this brings us back to the decaying Ottoman Empire, because in fact the oil that was known about during this period existed in several places, but perhaps from the perspective of Europeans, the most important place is in the region of the Caucasus and around the Caspian Sea, uh, on the edges between the Ottoman Empire and Russia. So what this decay of the Ottoman Empire also signified was the desire among European powers to get concessions in Ottoman, in Ottoman territories that held oil. So one of the things that the Germans did, for instance, was extend lots of loans to this uh, fiscally weak Ottoman Empire, and in exchange for that, they were granted various concessions. For instance, they were granted the right to build a railway in the early 20th century that would have stretched, had it ever been finished, and it wasn't quite finished, between Berlin and Baghdad. And this uh, symbolized, of course, Germany's newfound interest in territorial expansion, but it was also connected to this general story of desire for access to oil. And this very much upset the British, because they uh, perceived the general region of the Middle East as within their orbit of interest. Of course, the key piece of their empire in India wasn't too far away. And so to add the Germans to the mix of these tensions which had already involved the Russians who were also interested in the territory around northern Italy, in India and expanding into the Middle East, this created a real centerpiece for these emerging inter-imperial tensions. Okay, so once uh, Bosnia was annexed by the Austrians and this territory in southern Europe called the Balkan Peninsula, which was uh, in the process of being stripped away from the Ottoman Empire, would in fact become the place where World War I started. Now that isn't actually exactly where the oil is, but it fits into this geopolitical problem of what to do with the decaying Ottoman Empire and the tensions caused therefrom.
So there were various little flashpoints and crises, uh, a series of little uh, conflicts involving the Austrians and other powers in the Balkan Peninsula. But of course, as you probably know, what finally became called World War I began in this very region of Bosnia-Herzegovina, namely the city of Sarajevo, with the assassination of an Austrian prince, the heir to the Austrian crown, Franz Ferdinand, in June of 1914. Now, it's a funny thing to say that the assassination of Franz Ferdinand caused World War I, because the truth is that Franz Ferdinand was mostly hated in Austria. Uh, he was all but disowned by his own father, and uh, nobody was really all that sad to see him go. Uh, nonetheless, this assassination was the basis, or at least the starting point, for a chain of events which finally led to the First World War. All of which is to say that really you could say that the assassination of Franz Ferdinand was an excuse. So we don't have time to talk in any great detail about what happened. But to suffice it to say that when their prince was assassinated, the Austrians issued an ultimatum to the people who had done it, the Serbs, saying, give us all sorts of stuff, and if you don't, you're going to have trouble. Well, they made this ultim ultimatum in such a way they knew the Serbs would refuse it. And they were egged on in doing so by their allies, the Germans. Well, of course, the Serbs did refuse this uh, ultimatum, and so by the end of July, the next month, 1914, we had war declared between Austria and Serb Serbia, and Germany's ally of the Austrians then uh, entered the war as well. And Russia, the ally of the Serbs, also declared war. So right now what we have, is, as of uh, late July, uh, very early August, 1914, is a war in the Balkans between Austria, Germany, Serbia, and Russia. But of course, that doesn't yet explain why World War I is World War I. That would explain why we would have another conflict in the Balkans, perhaps a bit nastier than the ones that had come previously, but certainly not what we would have come to call World War I. Well, what happens next, and again, I don't have time to talk about it in this great detail, is that Germany, which, as we've already suggested, had larger, bigger territorial ambitions, decided to invade France. So the famous Schlieffen Plan was enacted, whereby in this uh, sweeping movement through northern Germany via Belgium, uh, Germany invaded. And when uh, that happened, Britain declared war on Germany, ostensibly because uh, Belgium was an ally of uh, uh, Britain, and therefore there was a defensive treaty which required the British to enter into the war, but really because the British were concerned about German expansion and certainly could not allow uh, Germany to simply roll over France without an answer. So now we have the war expanding. We have the war, not just a localized Balkan war, but a war between uh, the biggest empire uh, in the world, the British, and if you like, the most ambitious empire, with the possible exception of the United States, in Germany. So this creates what was called the Western Front, this battle line between Germany and its allies, which went from the North Sea on the Belgian-French border in the region called Flanders, all the way down to Switzerland, which was neutral territory. And it involved uh, something which brings us to our third artifact. This is an image, a photograph of a trench. This is uh, namely the 11th Cheshire Regiment, a British regiment, fighting in this trench on a region of uh, the Western Front called the Somme, named after a river in eastern France, in 1916. And this gives us a hint of why World War I was uh, not just a world war geographically speaking, because in addition to this Western Front and the Balkans we've uh, already talked about there was fighting, for instance, all the way in China, there was fighting in Africa, and it was a world war in the sense that it involved soldiers from all over these empires. When Britain got involved in the First World War, they called upon forces from all over their territorial acquisitions. Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, Indians were all brought to various flashpoints throughout the world, including the Western Front in these trenches, to fight on behalf of the mother country, as it were. Okay, so that's one way that we can call it a world war. But the other way is that we can call it a total war in the sense that this involved 
uh, material and forces and industrial production throughout society. And this is represented in the very nature of trench warfare because what we can basically say is that weapons technology and industrial technology had reached a point where defensive war, uh, figuring out how to kill a lot of people and stop the advancement of an enemy was very advanced. But offensive techniques against those new industrial weaponries were not so advanced. So what happened is when the Germans invaded France, they finally got stopped by uh, the opposing forces of the Belgians, the French, and the British. And they dug in. They built trenches, and this long line of trenches and auxiliary trenches appeared across this Western Front again from the uh, North Sea all the way down to Switzerland. And both sides had these trenches. And on either side uh, was what was called no man's land, this cratered out uh, territory filled with another uh, important industrial innovation, barbed wire and decaying corpses, rats, uh, shell craters, etc. So uh, what this meant is that for four years, these two sides on the Western Front, uh, the Germans and their allies, but basically the Germans and the uh, British, French, Belgians, and a little bit later, the uh, Americans, fought it out to a virtual stalemate. They could attack, and indeed they did send wave after wave of soldiers so-called over the top, that is, going up onto the top of these defensive trenches and running into this no man's land, mostly to be mowed down by machine gun uh, fire or hung up on the wire until they bled to death or were picked off by a sniper. Uh, and so this represented an incredibly gruesome spectacle which was played out in slow motion and which generals on either side really didn't know how to solve until finally, of course, the Germans were exhausted uh, through this long uh, and drawn out conflict and were forced to surrender in late 1918. But this mode of warfare, this incredibly destructive mode of warfare where wave after wave of soldiers were sent into this uh, technology, uh, machine guns, barbed wire, and most horrifically, poison gas, which also made its first appearance in World War I. And of course, there was other important technology which came to the fore during the war, for instance, airplanes or submarines, dirigibles, uh, and indeed tanks uh, were used during World War I. This also involved the conversion of entire economies to fight this war on this industrial scale. So total war also means the creation of war economies. If you think about warfare in the 19th century or the 18th century, say during the Napoleonic era, you would talk about armies going out onto a field of battle, fighting it out, whoever won would be the winner and then treaties would be made accordingly. What we're talking about now is an entire population given over to the war effort. If you're not fighting, you are presumably involved in the effort in some other way. For instance, if you're a woman, uh, women were brought into the workforce for the first time on a truly large scale during World War I because they did things like worked in munitions factories, churning out all of these bombs and bullets and grenades and howitzers to fight this total war. There are interesting side effects of that, for instance, in both Britain and the United States, women finally got the vote after World War I, largely because they were able to successfully make the argument that having been brought into the work phase, brought into this massive warfare effort on such a large scale during this period, they could not simply be cast to the side politically after the war ended. But that's, of course, uh, another topic for another day. What we can say, however, is that the war was uh, horrific and uh, an unprecedented event in human history. Nothing even remotely like this uh, destructive had ever happened. And in a subsequent uh, video, we're going to talk about some of the consequences of this unprecedented war and the way in which it was unsuccessfully, as it turned out, because we know that World War II happened just two decades later. Nonetheless, the way that it was uh, attempted to create a stable peace after World War I, which somehow responded to the reasons why people at the time thought World War I happened. But without trying to answer that question, let's raise that very issue as the question we're going to deal with in class. And I want to frame this question in a specific way uh, to fit in with 
broader conversations we've been having. Namely, should we understand World War I as a consequence of liberal capitalism or uh, as a product of it? In other words, did liberal capitalism cause World War I or did World War I happen because somehow uh, liberal capitalism broke down, that is, in spite of liberal capitalism. Now, if you think back to how we started this uh, conversation with Polanyi and the double movement, uh, perhaps that ought to give you some clue about how I might personally seek to direct this discussion. But again, this is something we'll talk about in more detail when we see each other. Finally, our connections map. Well, we can and have, to some extent, connect this discussion of the emergence of World War I, this horrific and uh, awful conflict, to the discussion of imperialism and tensions between uh, empires, which finally spills over into this conflict. We could also connect it to the story of industry and what we've called the Second Iron Age or the Second Industrial Revolution. And of course, we've seen a key stage of that exemplified here with the emergence of the automobile or indeed fossil fuels age in its uh, next important petroleum-based stage and the uh, end, therefore, of coal as the central form of fossil fuel. And we could also connect this, of course, to the story of globalization because what we're seeing is a world war, which is therefore itself the product of this globalized capitalist system, which involves uh, not just the expansion of global trade, but the expansion of global empires and the ensuing tensions therefrom. Okay, thanks very much.